Okay, so I guess you can see the screen. Yes. Okay, great. So, hey everyone, uh, welcome to Analytics Talk. Thank you so much for joining in at the very earliest time and we will now kick off. We have our speakers as well. So let's, today, uh, this is the November edition, not the November edition, this is the this, uh, December edition for Analytics Tableau user group. And Tableau, uh, Analytics Talk is a bit different because it's totally dedicated to learning all about Analytics and Tableau. And I think you know more than me because you have been attending Analytics Talk. So, I'll just go through the tug leaders. We have Annabelle, she is just on the airport. She's uh, flying today, and but she's with us as well. And she's the head of Center of Excellence at Wonderbell. Uh, this is me, Prasant Prem. I'm a data visualization coach and mostly working as a freelancer for now. And we have Chimdi, who is a data viz manager at Post Media Network. So let's start with Annabelle Rincon. She, she has a passion for Tableau that we obviously know about, and also for dog as well as she loves chocolate. She she is based out of Zurich, and she is also co-leading Data Plus Women Zurich. So you can also scan the QR code here, and you can also register on that channel. This is me. Uh, I'm a Tableau visionary, a social ambassador, and also a Tableau geek. Uh, I have been uh, working around uh, mentoring programs mostly, and that is how Tableau Buddy came into existence. Also, I've been uh, building a new program that is also going on. Apart from all of my Tableau and geeky side, I'm an anime fan, and I love that. Like, uh, if, you, if you are here, give me a thumbs up, or yes, if you're an anime fan as well. And this is Chimdi. So he he's a database manager, and also he... Ha, is doing freelance why with site analytics and he has a tremendous like uh, it's a great tablet journey that he has and if you if you look at his portfolio it totally makes sense that he believes in harnessing data and design to make users more receptive to visual insights fun fact about him that he's as an artist he enjoys experimenting with different visualization styles and design and he also constantly needs his data viz fix and sometimes gets withdrawal like uh, he he always tries to find something creative and doing something out of the box so that is who he is okay so ground rules uh please interact with the audience and with every one of us using the chat section if you have any questions please go through the q a that is where you can put all your questions and we will answer there and our speakers will answer there as well just one rule since it's being recorded, just focus on the session as and is enjoy as much as you want. In between, if you want to take screenshots, post it on LinkedIn, Twitter, that's totally your game. Okay, so I'll now talk about the agenda. So this was the welcome. And now second, we have Seku Tyler. He will be talking about working with messy data, real world data cleaning challenges and solutions that looks like a very good as well as a very interesting topic for analysts. And then we have Derek Murray talking about supercharging your Tableau experience using R and ggplot. And then we have Joshua Milligan, that, and he's going to talk about telling data stories that matter, the place of purposeful empathy in visual analytics. And I think you are in for a treat, like all these three different subjects I think it's going to be very interesting. So uh, now I'll hand over to Chimdi. Awesome, thanks a lot, Prasad. So I'm gonna bring in our speakers. Would you mind going to the next slide? Awesome. So first off, we have Seku Tyler, who I don't believe is a stranger to anyone here. He's been around for a while. He's a self-proclaimed data geek, and he combines the scientific elements of data analysis with the narrative properties of visualization. And so he's, he has over 10 years of experience as an independent data analytics consultant, and he has a proven track record of helping people essentially see 
their businesses better by helping them, you know, with some actionable insights. He is also um, awfully, you know, fashion professional development workshops. So I guess if you're not too familiar, he's got like a YouTube channel and he does a lot of, you know, work to essentially expose people to Power BI, Tableau. And I think something that's not even here I recently, you, you'll notice he's been talking a lot about chat GPT. So when it comes to like complementary tools on the technical side with Tableau, I think Seiko is someone who really kind of dives into that and gives us some good insights that we can use to improve our work there. And so aside from data, he is a speaker, a mentor, he enjoys reading, and he is a Tennessee Titans and LA Lakers fan. But most of all, he's happiest spending time with his wife and his beautiful daughter. He definitely posts a lot about them on Twitter. So if you're curious, you can go check out his profile and you can see the beautiful family there. And he also loves to hang out with friends and family. So today he's going to talk to us about working with messy data and essentially real world data challenge, cleaning challenges and solutions. I think this is something that is going to be very helpful because of course, for any practitioner who has been around for however long, you get to understand that, you know, getting a clean data set is just something that's more of a blessing, not an expectation. A lot of times you may have to do this by yourself. And so getting from clean, so from messy to clean is really important. And Seku is going to help us out with some ways to get that going. So I'm going to pass it over to you, Seku. Please give us some great stuff today. Appreciate that. Thanks for that introduction. And happy Thursday, everybody. Excited to uh, demo and get this going. So have some slides ready. So uh should have been on the first page all right we're working with messy data real world challenges data cleaning challenges as Jimmy said i'm Seku tyler appreciate the introduction that was amazing i really appreciate it um agenda for today introduction talk about some common data cleaning challenges go over a few case studies show you how to do some stuff in tableau prep and even show you how to do some stuff in tableau and microsoft excel uh talk about data quality issues and kind of show you some techniques that you can use save some time for q a discussion and then conclusion um, as Shimdi mentioned, I won't read over it again, but basically follow me on social media platforms uh, at SQL Seku. I'm on Twitter, YouTube, TikTok, but I barely post anything on TikTok, but I'm on there. So follow me if you want to keep along. Uh, personally, 10 years of experience, multiple tools, multiple things. I pretty much just want to keep a job. So I try and stay busy. And I am a Tableau certified consultant, and I'm currently a Tableau social ambassador. So that is a little bit about me. But when we think about common data challenges, one of the biggest questions I believe is where should your data be cleaned and processed and be formatted at? Um, I think a lot of practitioners, data analysts, you know, especially when you're using the BI tool, will want to do some of this stuff in the tool itself, um, where some of the people might want to do it in their database, Excel file, the source of truth. So it really depends, like, where should I do this stuff? Where should I do some of these transformations? And one rule of thumb that I typically try and apply is that data should be transformed as far upstream as possible and as far downstream as necessary. And basically what this means is that if you can do some transformations at the source, whether it's your database, data warehouse, your Excel file, whatever your source of truth is, and it is a consistent transformation that is can be used for several different reports, do it there because you have a single source of truth. You have the logic that's already applied there at the source, and it makes it easier for other applications. So even though we're using Tableau, there could be some other applications that are using this database or this Excel file that you want to make sure that the logic is applied. But then we also know that's not always the reality. Sometimes we have to do stuff in the actual application itself. So when we say as far downstream as necessary, there are times where we do actually need to apply some transformations in Tableau, whether we have to do an LOD calculation or do some custom grouping or what have you, like there's things where we have to do it in Tableau. So this is my personal rule of thumb I got from Maxim um, that I try and live by when I have the, the ability to do it. So from a visual standpoint, like I mentioned, upstream means closer to where the data is originally produced. So Upstream, if you can make these transformations in a database or in your Excel file or whatever your source is, do that as possible because you will have a much cleaner single source of truth. All reports typically are coming from this source. So I'm pretty sure a lot of us have been in a scenario where we create a report, 
coworker created a report, we have different results because we're using different logic in these particular results, or we created extracts that have logic in one workbook and then there's logic applied in a different workbook. We're looking at the extracts and I'm like, I don't know what's going on. Why are our numbers different? If we can do as much of some of this custom sum summarization, custom uh, if statements, category callouts in the source, that single source of truth becomes a lot more better and you can QA it a lot easier. And then downstream, like I mentioned, right, there are some times where we have to do some stuff in Tableau um, and we need to do this. So I'm going to ask a couple, well, well, when we think about the architecture, so you might hear this terminology. Um, it's really popular now, especially if you hear stuff about the data lake, the lake house and data warehousing and stuff. It's basically the medallion architecture and a visual representation of this when it comes to data quality is that your bronze layer is your basically your raw files you're, you're bringing it in all your raw information there's no cleanup it's just bringing in everything so you have it as a source then you have a silver layer that has some cleanup maybe a little bit of aggregation but there's still some historical stuff it might not be the most polished and ready for reporting and then the ideal structure is our gold layer so the gold layer has everything that we need we have the single source of truth we have the categories that we need we have the spelling that we want we have the format that we want we have it in really really clean reporting format and that way tableau can just go on top of that and it makes the reporting life easier so i just want to call this terminology out because this is a popular terminology medallion architecture um, that is out there and if, if you're starting to understand more read more about the lake house and data lake and so on and so forth you probably will hear this architecture so all that to say if you can do some of your transformations you try and want to do that and hit the gold layer so that way when tableau gets on top of your gold layer your reporting layer it's already a clean data set. You've done a lot of transformation in the database, so it makes your life much easier as a developer. So I'm going to ask a couple of questions. Uh, one being, should I transform data in a data warehouse or in Tableau? So I believe the answer to this is you should do a lot of your transformations in your data warehouse. Because basically performing transformations in your data warehouse ensures that your analytic solutions should be plural that use the data have ready access to what it needs and that every solution downstream in the warehouse is using a consistent version of the data. So just to reiterate on this, if you're doing a stuff in the warehouse and it's cleaner and it's done in the warehouse, everything downstream should have the exact same single source of truth. So business owners, executives, whoever's looking at your report, best case scenario, they're not yelling at you because you're all coming from the same single source of truth. Another question that you might think about is, should I remove columns in a data warehouse or in Tableau itself? And I believe when you're creating different reports, be mindful of removing columns in the source system, because if you remove it in the source, you never know the, da the downward implications of removing stuff from the source itself. So there could be reports or other cap applications or things that are leveraging columns um, that can have an impact on reporting. So best case scenario, if you're creating an extract, if you're creating something and you need to not use it for an extract that you're building out or for a report you, you're using, I recommend using Tableau's hide all unused field functionality to remove columns that are not needed for your either dashboard or for your extract. And then your source system stays the same, but your extract is only using, you're only pulling in what you need. As a good rule of thumb, especially with report building, I believe that you should only bring in what you need and just leave out. That way you have a better extract, you have a better performing report, and everything's looking good. So just to show you what that looks like, if we actually hop into Tableau. Let's say I just built a very basic dashboard, not that great at all. But I really just want to show you all the examples of how to hide un unused columns if you haven't used this before. If you go up here to the top right and hit the drop down arrow up here, you click the drop down arrow, you see an area that says hide all unused fields. And basically what this does is like, if I'm not using it, I can just hide it from our report and then it's gone. So this quickly, even though it's in your data set, if you connect it to it, when you're building out your extracts or your single source of truth in Tableau, your source system isn't changed, but your report is only bringing in information that you want. So this is a really good tip that I use Sorry, sorry, just to cut you off, Seiko, but I think we're still seeing um, your slides. I don't know if it's supposed to have moved over to like Tableau or something else. It should have, because I did the whole window. One second. Okay. Uh, oh, you're right. I should have an entire screen. My bad. Can you see it now? Yep. Perfect. Right. Thank you for that. Sorry about that. 
All right. So what I was saying is that I have a great dashboard that looks nothing like Chim Lee has ever produced because he's amazing. He makes great stuff. Uh, this simple dashboard is just two different sheets. It's just a bar chart and a map. And basically what I was saying is that even though I have all these fields in here and that could be coming in from the database, I only want to use the stuff that I want to use or I want to only want to create an extract with the information that I want. So what you can do is click this drop down arrow at the top. If you haven't used it before, select this and select hide all unused fields. And what this does now is it removes the fields that you're not using in your worksheet. So now when you're publishing an extract or whatever you're doing, right, if you're creating a dashboard, you only have the relevant fields that you need. It becomes a lot easier to consume. It's much easier for you. And then your source database stays the same. So you're not removing unnecessary stuff that could be used in other reports. So there's a good tip that I typically use when I'm trying to eliminate some of the noise and do it downstream as possible. All right, so let's actually go into actual data cleaning and massaging. So this, I have a couple of examples of some things that you can do when it comes to your format. Um, we're going to use Tableau Prep for this particular example, but let's say you have a scenario where you have a data set and you have an application that's bringing in phone records, um, date records in different format that you need. So let's say I have you know, different areas. So I'll show you an example. So if we look at a potential thing, if we look at our phone numbers, we see that this has parentheses, it has a hyphen, this is a period, spaces, so on and so forth. So it's not a consistent format for what we need. We want to make sure that we have a consistent format for our phone numbers. Um, in this example, I'll show you how to do that in Tableau Prep. So I just have this in a simple Excel sheet. If I go into Tableau Prep, I'll bring in my data formats, and we'll see that I'll create a clean step. So as we see here, there's a couple of different ways that we can go about cleaning this up to making it easier and appealing for the report user to use. So what you can do, a couple options. The first option, you can go to clean and you can select remove punctuation. And what that does, it removes some of the punctuation and stuff, but it's still not there. So if we look at like the first couple of records, we see there's a space here, space below, but it's still not in the format that we want. So we can do that. And then we can also select clean and remove all spaces. So now we have it in a format to where it's clean and it's in our numerical format that we want. And then we can quickly do a if statement to do this at the source. And Tim D mentioned earlier that I like to use AI. So AI wrote this. I didn't create this from scratch. I pulled this from ChatGPT, but it gave me this great uh, case statement for this particular example to be able to generate the parentheses for me. So now if we select this parentheses, hit apply, we see now that we have the phone number in the format that we need, and it's consistent with what we want. So this is a way of cleaning like that data and getting it in a format that we need downstream because now once we have a report, it's clean, it's good, everything is done. Our report users don't have to do this every single time in Tableau desktop. They can do this. Well, you already done all the transformations or you've done the transformations for yourself. You just upload it somewhere and you're good to go. Another way you can do this, this is actually using regular expressions. So I'm not the best person at regular expressions. Uh, as I was building this out, I was like, oh, this is really cool. Let me figure out how to do this. So we just go back to where we're at. I can create a regular expression. And if we look at this regular expression uh, using regular X replace, we see that we're looking at the phone number and that the regular expression is basically replacing all the information that we want using slash D with a null value. And once we have that cleaned up, we can call it phone. And then now with the regular expressions, we have that same information in the same format. So two different ways. If you want to code, you can use regular expressions to code it out, create a calculate field, or you can use Tableau Prep's native functionality to clean it up and then use case statements, get it in the format that you want. So two different ways to use the tools, but either way, you've done the job and then now you can upload it and um, upload it to a space that you want, whether it's an Excel file or to your database. Next one, let's say we have duplicate records. So as we know, duplicate records can cause overcounting, uh, summarization, it can just do cause a different error. So you wanna be mindful of your duplicate records, especially 
if you understand data modeling. So if you understand data modeling, you have a dimension table that should be one record per attribute. So one category. So if you're looking at states, it should be one record per the state. Um, where if you have a fact table where there's many different records that join to it. So understanding that if you have duplicates in your dimension tables can cause some issues. So really the analysis and anything that you're doing uh, can cause performance issues. So there's a way to remove duplicates depending on what you need. I'm going to show you how to remove duplicates if you're trying to create like a lookup table or you're trying to summarize a group information using Tableau Prep. So if we're in Tableau Prep and I'm going to use our favorite data set, which is Superstore, which has several duplicates depending on what's in here, um, we see that our customer, Philip Over, has several duplicate records, but let's say I just want one lookup table with customer name, or if I just want to look at customer ID, customer name, I can do that as well. But if we go on in Tableau Pro, and if I pull in so my duplicate data, I'll show you a couple of different ways to remove duplicates. By default, if you go to aggregate and you bring in the categories, so remember, we're looking at categories for this example to remove duplicates. If by default, if I bring in customer ID and customer name, we see now that by default, there's only one record because the duplicates have gone away. So aggregating your information and creating a lookup table this way automatically reduces some of that duplication for you. If you wanted to aggregate and like count and you know look at some of someone's sales, you could bring that into a duplicate row and then you've done all the aggregate for you. So we can see in this example that Dana has 15 records. Um, but there's only one row with this output for Dana Cato's. So, but if you just want to look up table, you don't necessarily have to bring in the aggregated fields. You can just have a, a aggregated field and do group by, and then now you have your lookup table for just these individuals. Another way of doing this is to actually create a rank partition. So if I wanted to only, again, for this example, I only want to create a lookup table for customer ID and customer name. I select both of these, select um, keep only. So I have these two, but as we can see, there's still a lot of duplicates here. There's multiple rows on here. So what I can do is create a calculated field to create a partition and then filter on that partition. So a partition, if you're familiar with SQL, is basically you are doing an order by and you're partitioning by the unique in the, the unique ID that you're partitioning by. So in this example, I just want to do a customer ID and then I want to order by customer name and then it's going to generate a row number for me. So if I call this Frank and if I hit apply, we'll see that each unique ID now has its own unique record. So although there are 15 records for Natalie, as I scroll down, we see David starts at one because I have that partition by the customer ID. Same thing for Eric, Erica. So if I want to create and remove duplicates, I only want the first record. What you can do is after you created that calculated field, select keep only one. And then now you have the same unique records for just those individuals. So you remove duplicates, you have a lookup table that you know is clean and prestige. And then you can use that as a, again, a dimension table, a lookup table, however you want to do it, but you have a, a data set that is specifically just with customer ID and customer name. So you can expand upon this depending on what your needs are, but this is how you can quickly remove duplicate uh, files in here. If you wanted to do this in Excel, you could quickly do this at the source as well. So if you select data, if you haven't used data tab before, if you're using Excel, it's a lot of cool stuff that you can do in here. But what you can do is select from table range. So you select your columns and headers and you know pick the range that you want. And it'll automatically pull it in for you. You see that my table has headers. And it's going to open up Power Query. So Power Query does allows you to do a lot of transformations as well. So same example. Let's say I only want to keep customer ID and customer name. Select remove other columns. Uh, like I said, select remove other columns. My bad. Hit remove other columns. And then from here, if I right click and select remove duplicates, now in a couple of clicks, I've done the exact same thing, all my duplicates there, and I have a duplicate lookup table quickly in Excel. Then I can save this in Excel and it can become a source of a lookup table for me. So, a couple of different ways you can use Tableau Prep, you use Excel to create just a duplicate file.
All right, another thing as well is missing values in the data set. So oftentimes data sets have missing values, which can impact your analysis, your modeling. So a customer data set has missing income, which impacts financial analysis. What I believe is you need to understand the impact of your missing values. Uh, a missing value, a no value, and a blank value all have three different meanings. So basically a no value means that there's no value for a given record. Blank value means that there's no value for a record and then the value is empty or is zero. So here's an analogy I saw as I was putting this together that I thought was pretty cool. But basically if I have a no value, that means the child is not born yet. So child is just, it's not born, pregnant, but it's just not born yet. A blank value means that a child is born, but we haven't given an attribute to the child. So we haven't given it an age, we haven't told the name, it's just born, but we haven't filled in our record set because it just has not been applied. And a zero value in this example means that a child is born, but of the age zero. So if you're doing any type of averages or you're doing any type of calculations and you have a zero value in there, it's a legit zero value because the child itself is zero, it's not one yet. So your average age, if you're looking at, you know, any type of birth and records or what have you, um, could be zero because you actually have zeros. Whereas if you have blank and nulls, it can skew, skew your results a little bit. So I really believe understanding what missing values in your data set require a conversation with your business and your team to understand, hey, is this really no? Should this have been filled out? Is this a mishap? Should it be zero? And that leads to different type of results in your analysis. All right, so we think about data integrity, uh, inconsistent data integrity, typos, errors, impact uh, integrity. So a lot of different things that you can do is you can implement data validation rules. Uh, you can do some profiling and you can conduct thorough data cleaning to eliminate typos and errors. A couple things that we can do in Tableau Prep is we can create, we can use the inherent roles that are there. So if we want, we can select the different roles that we want and that we know the category will be there. So just in the case for this example, let's say that state province and just as, as example, I know this is always gonna be a state, I want it to be a state, or I think this should be a city. Using the different roles that are available, your geographic roles, let's say you select city, I'm just throwing this out as an example. Let's say you select city, you see this explanation mark is there and it's saying like, hey, this is not validated. This is not what I expect. So it's quickly letting you know that the information that's input is not accurate to what I would expect. So understanding, you know, really what your inputs are and really what it is that's trying to do at the data source level these type of indicators are really helpful for profiling your information to understand what's going on and it can alert you that something was input wrong there's a no value here there's something not right um, and can alert you that something's not accurate as you would expect another thing that you do when it comes to profile is the ability to look at Tableau Prep. So by default, I know when I first started using Tableau Prep, I just like the tabular view, just show me the raw data. Like I don't really care about the distinct or the values or what's here, just show me what's in the table and I'll do my analysis that way. But I've grown to actually enjoy using this pane to kind of show me what type of outliers or what type of information is, that, is out there and kind of get a feel for it. Um, in this particular view, right, we have our bin. So it just shows the different type, the number of rows in our bin and how many are there. So it kind of gives a graphical view of, you know, what would I expect in my data set, especially I'm familiar with it. Let's say I have any outliers or anything that stands out and be like, well, something's going on, this isn't right. Um, same thing for looking at, hovering over this and looking at my unique values, I can quickly see, all right, this is in line or this is way more products that I would expect, or this is way more information that is not available. So you're able to kind of see some information there. Same thing with here, you can fix some of this information and and see like this input is wrong, is not what I expect, is not the greatest. So what's going on with our data? Let's go back to the source to see what's going on. Another thing that you can do in uh, Power Query, once you have it up, is if you, if you go to Power Query, like we were at before, if you select view, there is a distribution data preview that you can select. So if you select view, select data preview, this allows you to view similar records up here. So if I wanna look at the column profile, let's say I don't have anything selected. If I select column distribution, this quickly shows me what are my distinct values, what are my unique values, and what do I wanna do with it? So it gives me a profile pane here. 
also gives me your column profile as well. So right now, let's say like we looked at in Tableau Prep, we can quickly see the distribution of the records and the counts of it as well and see what's in there. Even that's row ID, that's a bad example. Let's select older ID and we can see the number of records for it. So again, it gives you a profile and it's like, is this information right? Is this wrong? Um, what can I do? Also, by default, this profile is doing it based on 1,000 rows. So again, depending on the number of size of data, if you're working with big data, this is just profile and doing your top 10. But if you want to, if you say you're working with a data set that has only like 20,000 rows, you have the ability to select column profile based on the entire data set. And it will do the entire profile on the data set. Again, you can look at this information and clean it up or adjust it as you see fit. If your source is Excel files, you can do this, output it to Excel. You've done a lot of your transformations and everything is good and clean and you're able to have one source of truth for your data set. All right. So another thing when it comes to our data quality is inconsistent. So there's various levels of data quality, um, various levels of different sources, impact on decision analytics. Big framework that we have is you want to profile the data, find business rule, and then test data against the uh, data quality assessments. A lot of information out there. I'm not going to go super high level into it, but here's a great slide that shows you a process that you can leverage. Excel data, use this, but basically you want to profile the data, understand the business rule, connect with the business, talk to the people, understand the rules. Where do you do that? Upstream, downstream. Define the rules, test against the rules as well, and then fix any errors that you're finding. That way it's not a consistent thing. This is good if you're using enterprise data. Same thing if you're using big data quality. You might have to use different tools, especially if you're using stuff for like bigger formats. So if you're using like, a, I don't know, Databricks, Snowflake, or whatever tools that you're using, you might have different quality rules, but this is kind of a process that you can use for each use case. Again, we want to do this in the source. That way, the source is cleaned up. We output it to our goal layer reporting, and then Tableau goes on top of it, and everybody life is happy. All our consumers love our reports. Uh, real quick, I'll just go and handling categorical data. Basically, categorical variables with too many levels or consistent labels is a big impact. So you, you can group, you can change some of these variables to numeral representations. So instead of it being a text field, you can change it to a numerical field. You have better performance. Um, how do you handle missing categorical data, data appropriately? You know, you talk to the people, uh, understand why is it missing? Is it a transformation thing? Is it something that I'm not applying? Is a case statement wrong that's messing up? That I have something wrong in my if statement? So understand why some of this categorical data is not correct. And if it gets really too complex, talk to your data science team if you have one, or if you're learning machine learning, understand it, understand how you do like fuzzy matching, or understand how you do some advanced things to really uh, create a really good categorical data for your visualizations and your dashboards. And then outliers anomalies, anomalies, I talked about it earlier, but basically these can distort your analysis and your modeling. So understand what your, your anomalies are, what your outliers are, can greatly impact and understanding it. So a couple of different techniques you can have is create Z scores, or you can use um, a range to understand outliers. And then from here, you can kind of have an impact of this number is really, really high. This is really low. What does that mean? Is this an error? Is it really real? And so understanding, you know, any outliers that you have in your data and creating, you know, re really simple visualization uh, to understand it can help you understand your analysis and be able to talk to your analysis. So if there's anything seasonal, an example, where this number is extremely high, it might not necessarily be wrong. It's just you just had a great sales day. But understanding that and how to talk to that and how to have concepts around it is really big. And then standardization, you want to make sure that you're just standardizing your uh, data across the board. So if you're using different schemas or different Excel files um, across the board, you just want to make sure that you're using a standard standardized process for that that aligns with industry best practice and regulations. And then handling large data sets, as we talked about with uh, a lot of volume, a lot of stuff, a lot of terminology out here, um, lake house, data lake, SQL, just different things, large data sets are characterized by the volume, complexity, the velocity. So how fast is it generating? Is it real time and a variety? So in a lake house, you have different formats that you can save. You can save tabular Excel file stuff that we're using, or you can save actual text, images, video sensors, and then take that metadata, uh, transform it, put it into an API, and then that data turns into a tabular format. So it really depends on the type of variety that you're storing and what you're using it for. 
So when it gets to that type of size, you might want to look at different look at different type of tools to understand the processing and getting some of that information out and cleaning it up so that you're not doing everything on your local computer. You're using some of the resources that are available. Um, but that's a different conversation. But if you run yourself trying to do stuff with large data sets, you know, think about some different tools that could potentially help you out with that. But biggest piece of takeaway that I want you all to understand. Transformation should be done upstream as possible. You want your reporting layer, whether you're creating like a SQL view that has the logic applied or you're creating a table or you are doing fuzzy matching, whatever your thing is, right? You want to create a single source of truth and that should be your gold layer. And then Tableau should go on top of that. That way, multiple reports on top of it all have a single source of truth and your reporting is very functional and everything is great. And all our executives are happy and we're like, I want to give you a raise because you're doing a fantastic job. I've never had such great reports. So that's the end goal is to make sure you just have a single source of truth. So if you don't take anything away from this, make sure that if you can as possible, do it at the source, clean it up, do it once, put BI uh, Tableau tool on top of it, do your reports and you're good to go. And do I have an extra slide? I don't have an extra slide. So with that, if you have any questions, it's all I had, Jim D. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Seku. So I think this is really valuable stuff. I mean, I, I don't think that you're going to have to utilize everything every time, but it's definitely helpful to at least know what's available to you. So I'm definitely going to be going to rewatch this. So thanks, Seku, for sharing the good stuff. Let me just quickly see if we've got any questions before we hop over to the next one. So let's see here. Okay using aggregates to deduplicate how can we retain other columns which are not part of the group after the aggregate step i believe this is specific to what we were being shown in tableau yeah yeah, yeah so that was just an example of let's say i only want to create a lookup file for those two columns um i can create that output that output then lives in my database and excel file and it lives there your source stays the same. So, I mean, if you want to bring in additional columns or if you want to, um, you know, add in more records and then filter it out, you can do that as well. So it really just depends on your use case. My particular use case for that example is like, hey, I just want a customer ID and customer name lookup table. I don't want the duplicates. I only want that specifically. Awesome. Thanks for that. Hopefully that's been helpful. Um, another one we have here is is there an admin tool or a way in Tableau to view potential downstream effects on removing a field or a data point from the source data? The, there is. It is Tableau. Oh, God, that's going to bother me. But Tableau does have one where you see the ramifications downward. So you can see your, your extract, your source, what it's connected to, and then the intricate effects of every single report. So you have like, SQL database, and you have your Tableau extract, and then the reports that are connected to it, and then you're able to see the outliers of the actual report. Oh man, it's not data management. That's gonna bother me. Uh, but there is one. Tableau does have one. I need Chimdi or, or Prasan or, or Daryl. Y'all help me out on this one. But I feel like there's one in-house on Tableau server or Tableau online that you can see the, the downward effects. Um, but who asked that? I can follow up with them. Okay, so yeah, the person, um, the name. Sorry, Jason Rhodes, I believe. Right. Yes. So I'll I'll put that in your chat, Seku. So if you need to do some one on ones, all right. Yeah. Cool. Perfect. Yeah. Well, I'll just. Sorry. Go ahead. Well, no, I'll say I'll follow up. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. And what I'll do is I'll just go to one more question, and then Seku, if you don't mind, we have a bit kind of scattered in there in the Q and A, so you can go ahead and like interact directly and help us answer if possible. Cool. Okay. So the next, the last one I'll take on is basically. I guess a simple one. What add-ins uh, have you chosen or enabled for AI supports in your workflows? Uh, what am I using? So I'm using ChatGPT for like if I'm stuck on like a Python script or even a SQL script or even like prep. Like I kind of throw stuff in there just to see like will it work. Um, there's one I've used for slides. I think it's like Pulse, um, where I can just give it like kind of the prompts what I'm going for to help me with slides. I'm gonna dabble in Microsoft Copilot here soon. Um, yeah, that one's I think cool. that's pretty much it. Those are probably the three. 
Awesome. Yeah, I find like with AI stuff, there's so much out there now. Like to actually find one that you're going to stick to, you're probably going to have to test out a few. But like a lot of them tend to just kind of, you know, really elevate things in, in a really nice way. So I'm kind of, you know, looking forward to seeing over the next few years, how does it all evolve and just how 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 great it's going to be helpful to us. So, yeah. So please, um, anyone who has questions, you can pop it in the Q&A, say who's going to be here with us and he's going to be able to answer those for you. I will go to bring on the next speaker. Uh, Persan, do you mind sharing your screen? Awesome. So we have the next speaker, Dara Moray, and he's been a data professional for over two decades. So definitely another person who is bringing a lot of experience into this space. Um, he's done analytics and visualization consulting for analytics and visualization for the past 10 years, but he seems to, he combines our with Tableau, he's an R aficionado. So that's coding, which I think, you know, when it comes to data and all that kind of stuff, R is really helpful there. He's also a multiple VOTD recipient and a top 15 finisher for the IronViz 2023 competition. He's passionate about the role of data and providing clarity about the world and enhancing the data skills of his colleagues his friends, and of course, the broader data fam community. So outside of work, Dara is a keen music fan and an amateur triathlete. And when he's not visiting, he is going to be spending quality time with his young son. He also posts a bit about his son, and it was kind of cool to see, you know, when he just recently became a new dad, he shared a bunch of experiences with us. So, you know, Definitely, definitely very passionate about family. And today he's going to be talking to us about supercharging our Tableau experience using R and ggplot, which are basically code-based tools. And so, you know, not everyone may kind of need that on a day to day, but I still think it's very helpful because there are certain situations where utilizing these is going to just make things that much more seamless. So I'm going to pass it off to Dara to get us some good stuff on R. Yeah, thanks so much, Jim D, for the introduction. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. I'm. It's quite early here in Australia, it's like uh, nearly four o'clock in the morning. So if I'm wow. talking a bit low, it's uh, because I'm trying not to wake up my young son. Um, yeah, thanks so much for the introduction, Jim D. Thanks, Prasan and Annabelle for having me along. Thanks for everyone to coming, coming along as well. Um, and also thanks for that really great uh, presentation there, Siko. Um, uh, yeah, a, a lot of great uh, tips that I, I picked up personally on, on data preparation and cleaning messy data. So I'm gonna kick it off. I'm gonna share screen. Hopefully this works correctly. Um, ah, yes, you can see my um, PowerPoint. Hopefully, let me know if you, if you can't, but I'll, I'll keep rolling because I'm conscious of time. So yeah, today I'm talking about supercharging Tableau with with code, as as Chimdi was saying, code-based tools, R and ggplot. Um, it hopefully is not too technical for people, but I, I'm trying to like uh, essentially get people kind of interested in, in using, uh, combining different tools with Tableau to kind of create new and interesting stuff. That's kind of like uh, what, what, the, uh, what I'm talking about today. So, um, yeah, so I'm definitely a chart and data nerd, as uh, Jim D was kind of talking about in the introduction. Uh, I live in Australia, uh, in a in a city called Brisbane, which is like the third uh, third biggest city in Australia. It's uh, not Sydney uh, or Melbourne, which everyone seems to know around the world, but uh, it's like the the one after that. Um, and yes, it is quite early in the morning at the uh, at the moment, but that's okay. I'm usually up this early anyway with uh, having a, a toddler. <laughs> it's a kind of a part of the course. Um, I'm a senior analytics and insights specialist at a company called Powerlink Queensland. That's in the energy sector. We're responsible for um, building large transmission lines and connecting up all the, the new green energy initiatives all around the state of Queensland. Um, I have, um, it feels a bit depressing to say about 20 years experience. Uh, I'm still young at heart, but uh, yeah, I've been doing analytics and information systems work um, uh, for the last 20 years. Uh, and I have qualifications in those areas. Um, I've also done stuff like history and international relations. So I'm often kind of doing visualizations around that kind of stuff. 
Uh, and yeah, as, as Chimdi said, uh, I'm a, I'm a long time Tableau and R fan, uh, you know, ambassador twice now, um, and yeah, got the odd visit of the day here, here and there, but most importantly, I'm a very passionate data professional. So yeah, that's me. And as I was kind of talking about just before today, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about methods of integrating charts, uh, in R's ggplot visualization package with into Tableau itself. Um, and I'm going to be focusing on charts that can be really difficult to produce uh, in Tableau natively. So yes, it's going to get a bit nerdy, but I, I'm going to try to keep the nerdiness to a minimum, not to scare everyone away. Uh, but definitely the objective of this presentation is actually to, to more feed your imagination, as I said. Um, and I, I really want to spark ideas uh, rather than really talk about a really highly prescriptive guide on how to do this. So we, I'm going to touch on um, the integration process between the two platforms, um, and, and give you uh, give, give you the, kind of some introduction to the tool, tool uh, Tableau and and ours combined capabilities. Um, very definitely keen to hear your thoughts at the end via questions. Um, even if you're a bit skeptical of this approach, it's kind of this kind of this particular approach I'm talking about is a bit new to me um, as well and or also other potential use cases. So um, yeah, very keen to hear what the, the audience says at the end. Um, the agenda, I'm gonna give you a very brief introduction to what R and ggplot are all about. I appreciate not everyone, you know, plays in the code-based tools like, like um, uh, programming languages. Um, I also kind of talk on why you would even consider integrating the tool tools. Um, I should, point out that actually R integration in Tableau has been around for quite some time, actually, um, typically by using, bringing R scripts into calculated fields. Um, uh, and as we were talking in the chat in the last presentation, uh, you can use R scripting within Tableau prep itself, but I'm going to be kind of talking about a completely different use case, uh, which is using um, a, a package within R called Shiny Tableau to, to extend Tableau's uh, availability. And then I'm going to attempt a live demonstration. I have tested this several times at home, but you know, uh, Murphy's Law, I, it might go completely haywire. Uh, hopefully that doesn't happen. Uh, and then at the end, I'll, I'll talk about the pros and cons of, of this approach and, and hopefully hear from the audience on, on what you what you guys think. So that's kind of the rough agenda. Hopefully I stick to it um, and, uh, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll kick on. So what is R? Well, it is a very widely used open source programming language, pretty much uh, tailored for statistical computing, data manipulation, and also graphics. Um, emerged in the late, early 1990s um, out of the University of Auckland in New Zealand. Um, and it definitely allows for very powerful data analysis uh, and manipulation of data sets of all time, size. And that, this is how actually I got into R originally is when I was trying to load in massive, massive data sets into an early version of Tableau Prep and noticed that it was it was really chewing up a lot of resources when, when I was trying to use Prep. but um, I decided to roll the dice, give it, give an R a shot, and it it really can. Uh, it was very, very quick to be able to do data preparation uh, uh, on large data sets. So um, I should mention that I don't consider myself an R master by any stretch of the means. I, I'd say a solid intermediate intermediate uh, programmer. Uh, there's possibly people in the room who are way better than at. at at doing R scripting and I, that I, than I am. So I apologize in advance if, if this is a bit basic for, for those people. Um, but yes, it, the thing I wanted to talk about is R is highly extens extensible platform. There's well over 10,000 packages uh, in the community. And what this kind of means is like for pretty much any data manipulation problem that you have, it's probably pretty likely that someone has built like a, a package for it. Um, so you're probably thinking, you know, what the hell is Sarah talking about when he's talking about packages? Um, well, it, the packages are essentially um, blocks of code that uh, people have built uh, that plug into R. Um, again, I'm going to talk a bit more shop, shop about what ggplot is. So ggplot actually is part of R. It's an open, data, open source data visualization package that implements um, the grammar of graphics, which is was um, uh, was a paper put out by a guy called Leland Wilkinson in the early 2000s. Um, it, it's uh, all about um, like how to conceptualize 
building graphics. Uh, Leland actually went on to become the vice president of statistics at Tableau uh, later after publishing this. So essentially, um, it's a, a system of being able to chart or plot um, uh, data points by layering down what they call semantic components, uh, such as layers and geometries. Now, if you've used Tableau, this is probably familiar to you, at least conceptually, because if you look at the Tableau pane, it's kind of similar when we build a pane, we will kind of layer marks down on the pane using the data. We put on axes, labels, legends, etc. That's essentially what ggplot does as well. It's, it's the approach that it takes. Um, and yeah, as I said, yeah, chart elements are essentially laid on top of each other to, to create graphics. So to give you a very, very advanced example of what ggplot can do, um, here's um, a series of charts built in ggplot itself by a guy in the, in the in this community called Cedric Scherer, who's uh, uh, widely known in the R visualization community for, for really pushing the boundaries. Um, and, you know, uh, the, essentially, he can use this visualization pro platform to build very complex graphics, um, which often would be hard to do in Tableau in some cases. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, I want to kind of give you guys a kind of a background of what I'm talking about in R and ggplot and how, and eventually I connect it all up. So as I said, ggplot often excels at, at, at build, excels, no, no pun intended, at uh, building, um, very complex plots. It, re it reduces outputting otherwise very complex charts to often like one or two lines of code. You can simply throw a data set at ggplot uh, function and, and tell it to draw a specific chart. So for instance, if you're familiar with a violin plot, which is just a, a method of visualizing uh, a distribution, uh, you can see here, here's a bit of R code. Um, I'll quickly kind of describe what's going on. It's essentially, there's a, it's throwing a data set called MT cars at a ggplot function uh, and saying, okay, map car cylinders. And I think it's miles per gallon variables to the X and Y axes and then and it output it as a violin plot. So literally it's two lines of codes to produce a very basic graph like that. Um, similarly, if you do density plots, which is another way of doing visual, uh, um, uh, distributions, it's a similar kind of thing. You, we're looking at diamond data here, and it's just telling ggplot to, you know, map the diamond data set. And we're going to look at the carrots uh, on the on the x axis and output it as a density plot. Um, so you're probably thinking, okay, Dara, we're at a Tableau user group. What's it's got to do with Tableau? So I'm going to try bring it all together uh, in the next series of uh, uh, next series of um, of uh, of slides. So my point here is Tableau is awesome. Like definitely big Tableau, big Tableau fan. Sorry, um, but hard plots can be hard to do in in some uh, in some uh, ways. So. Yeah, Tableau is great at, at visualization in about 99% of cases, but sometimes you get those advanced visualizations that do require a lot of data preparation and, and complex calculations. So, for example, if you wanted to create a violin plot in, in Tableau, um, the way I've done it in the past, um, and there could be easier ways uh, uh, built since, is essentially requires you to, do, to build like a, a data scaffold using an extra data source, you know, Excel spreadsheet connected to your main data source uh, and then use a series of what they call kernel density estimator calculations to essentially draw the, the curves of the violin plot, plot. And this essentially can be very time consuming and, and possibly very difficult to maintain um, if for some reason, um, you know, your boss or your organization requires you to, to put violin plots everywhere across your dashboards, um, you're going to possibly have a lot of headaches keeping uh, to maintaining those visualizations. Um, so that's why I, in some ways, they're, they're not, they're not used that much within Tableau, partly I would think because of the complexity of doing it, because it's not something that can really be done natively out of the box. Um, so yeah, my point here is yeah, uh, the hard plot, hard plots can be hand. So, but, but what I wanted to talk to you guys today is like, what, what if I could talk, tell you that actually you can have your cake and, and eat it too. So 
if you go back to, it seems like a while ago now, but Tableau version 2020.3, 20, the, the engineers introduced a feature called dashboard extensions. Um, this actually permits integration with applications outside of Tableau. And then just a year later, um, our, our studio employees, so our studio is a very popular uh, IDE uh, for, for programming and R. They, uh, a couple of our studio uh, employees released what they call a shiny Tableau package, which allowed you to take advantage of dashboard extensions. Um, it was specifically, it was a guy called Joe Cheng, who he actually created this um, data visualization framework called Shiny, which is um, uh, like basically the dashboard version of R. Um, these kind of events bridge the gap between using things like ggplot within Tableau. So it's not super well known about, and literally I knew about it, but up until like a week or two ago, I'd never really used it. Um, so I've been kind of programming away the last week or two to get ready for this presentation and kind of really exploring what you can do with these, with these kind of tools. Um, so as, uh, as the R Studio said, you know, the goal of Shiny Tableau is to, to let R users create re reusable Tableau dashboard extensions using the power of R and Shiny to generate visualizations that are not achievable within Tableau alone. Uh, it's probably a bit inaccurate. A lot of these visualizations are achievable within Tableau, uh, but uh, they're often with, you know, then often not really easy to do. So the Shiny Tableau essentially tries to kind of bridge that gap. So I just want to quickly talk on a, the conceptual overview of how this kind of works, and then I'm going to kind of show you an example within Tableau and R itself. Uh, hopefully that all goes to plan. So essentially, the, you, you start off in your IDE, your, your kind of programming environment, and you combine you know, the technologies of R plus ggplot plus also this shiny web framework. Um, what you do is uh, you can run some code, build and run some code, design a ggplot object in that area, uh, and then output a, a T-Rex file, which is a really cool file extension name, but actually it, it um, actually stands for Tableau. It's a Tableau extension file. So essentially you can output that. And then what happens is in, in your Tableau dashboard, you can see here, just this is kind of conceptually what you would have in a Tableau dashboard. Uh, you can then import um, this code by the Tableau dashboard extension area. And apologies if that's really small to see, but I'll show you it in a sec. Um, there's a little, in the objects pane on the dashboard, it has this little extension area. So essentially, in a broad overview, this is how it kind of works. You do your coding, you output a file, and then you can bring that extension uh, into your dashboard itself. So hopefully I'm not going to over time, but uh, I'm going to go through a, a use case example. Uh, I'm going to talk about local rents, so rent, renting in my own city of Brisbane in Australia. So you're not going to be very familiar with um, with many of the suburbs here, but uh, it, you don't really need to be uh, super familiar with um, with Brisbane to understand it. So hopefully it kind of it makes sense. So what I've done is it extracted a whole heap of rental data from suburbs within my city of Brisbane, Australia. And, and I want to analyze that rental data by dwelling type and suburb. So what I'm going to do is jump into Tableau. So hopefully this works. I'll just make sure. I might have to reshare my screen. Can you guys see Tableau at all? No? One second. Yes, we, we could see that. Oh, you could set so one second. I'm just going to. Yeah, OK, sorry. Sorry if this uh, doesn't. I might have to jump around a few times. So I'm in Tableau here. I've got a very, very basic, uh, arguably very bland looking dashboard. You can see here that um, it, it's just looking, I've got a couple of containers, uh, average weekly rents by dwelling type. We've got townhouse, house and flat. We've got the rental values here. We've got a histogram showing the distribution of, of rents by dwelling type, townhouse, house, flat. Um, hopefully people are familiar with histograms, but if you're not, what it's, doing, it's showing is kind of like the distribution. Uh, for example, in the in the house distribution, you can see in the middle bin for the around the 650 rent per week, there's about 30 suburbs which satisfy that condition. And over on the right is just a, a list of average weekly rents by suburbs within the city. So very very basic, nothing super super special. But let's just say that 
I'm very particular. I'm a very particular boss. And I go, oh, look, Dara, I don't, I don't like histograms. I want something a bit more fancy. Uh, I want something like a, a violin plot. Um, this is where kind of the use case where you could potentially consider using something like R and, and Shiny Tableau uh, rather than going off and um, going off and uh, like building complex data infrastructure to, to build violin plots within, within Tableau. So what I'm going to do is I've got R running as well. Um, let me know if it hasn't switched to R screenshot it's just not updating on my other screen but is it still stuck on tableau or can you see the other screen oh we still see tableau dara oh yeah sorry about this i'm not very familiar mm -hmm. with uh with um i'll share the entire screen that's right that's right isn't it yes that's better yeah, that's there better. we go ah oh, yeah we're rocking now yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um so i'm not going to take you through this code line by line because we'd be here like for several hours and uh that's pretty but what I want to kind of talk about, so I'm in R Studio, which is my R environment. What I'm kind of doing is I'm importing a whole bunch of packages or libraries. Uh, the, the ones I've kind of picked out here is the library Shiny Tableau and also ggplot. Uh, what, what essentially is happening is I'm creating a, a Shiny object, a Shiny kind of web application for visualization um, uh, platform. And I'm going to scroll down. Uh, to what's going on here and ignoring all this other configuration. But I just want to quickly kind of point out here that what I'm doing is this bit of code here is what it's saying is essentially, okay, give me a ggplot object. I'm going to take some variables from Tableau itself, a X variable and a Y variable, and then I'm just going to output a, output a, a, a violin plot. So hopefully this works. I'm going to run this code and kind of take you through it. Um, so what R Studio is doing is creating, it runs this code, creates a T-Rex file, I'm going to download it. Uh, I'm going to put it, save it into this directory and then jump back in, back into Tableau. I'm going to duplicate this dashboard. And then what I'm going to do, here's where the, hopefully the magic happens. I'm going to bring in one of these Tableau extension objects and It'll load this screen up. There's a whole heap of free ones made available by Tableau. I'm going to enter access local extensions. And then I'm going to bring in this object. And it comes in and goes, oh, you know, there's a ggplot object in Tableau. You need to do the configuration. Uh, I'm just going to get rid of this um, histogram. And within within the code itself I, I told it to do some configuration so this is like a shiny um interface and i'm going to call this violin plot ggplot i'm going to choose the data so i'm going to use this data set that's actually on this thing and i'm going to use the underlying data source um i know this says uh, this is the area where i map the x and y variables i know it says dimension and measure but actually it just stands for x and y i'm going to map the dimension uh to rent and the measure to, to dwelling and then go apply. And what that does is within like a few lines, uh, a few lines of code, I basically built a violin plot with really having not to do any data identification at all. Cool thing is, is also interacts with Tableau. So I can like hit the filters um, and make the, the plot itself uh, interact with Tableau as well, which is a really cool feature uh, that they built into this. Um, now you're kind of going, oh, okay, well, look, this ggplot's a bit like boring looking. I want to make it look a bit more like, uh, uh, a bit more like, you know, the colors I'm using, uh, these other gray colors. What I can do, I'm going to jump back into R uh, again, I've kind of got this already prepared. I'm going to comment out this set of code and uncomment this more styled viol violin plot. Um, so this is a ggplot object, but I'm doing some more styling, like I'm changing some of the title position, sizes of the elements, changing the the, um, the color of the violin plot. Just going to rerun this code. Hopefully this works. Oh, wait up, I have to stop the previous one, sorry. Um, rerun this code here. I don't actually have to re, I don't have to re-download it. It just basically, it's, should be already sorted. I'm going to jump back into it. You'll see it's grayed out now because I need to reload it. 
Um, and you can see that the styling has been applied. Like, so this looked different before, it's got the same color now. Um, essentially, uh, it's the same thing, but I've applied some styling um, to the plot. Um, so that's kind of like a violin plot, but like, I'm gonna show you a bit more because this is only kind of scratching the surface because ggplot's super powerful and can do like tons of different visualization types that often are hard to do in Tableau. I am going to show you a few other options just um, because I was experimenting and I got really excited, but I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna stop this uh, plugin running again. What I'm gonna do, I'm gonna comment this out and I'm gonna show you styled ridge line density plotting. And I'm going to run this code again. Okay, it looks to be running. And then what you can do is I'll reload. I'm oh, not about. Um, I'm going to reload this. And I've got density ridge line plots, literally a couple of lines of code. Uh, now I've got this plot that's very difficult to do in, in um, Tableau usually. Um, but I've literally got it going in like 10 lines of code. So that's really cool. Um, and I'm going to go PCD resistance because I'm not going to stop. I'm going to limit myself to density plots. I'm going to bring in something and I'll sh I don't know what you call it. I think they call it rain cloud plots. Um, I'm going to quickly show you this last use case example. So I'm going to stop this code again um, and then run this a bit more extensive bit of co code. Uh, which is essentially doing what they call a rain cloud density plot. Uh, hard to explain, but as soon as you see it, you'll probably be like, oh, I kind of understand what this is, it's essentially distributions. So I'm, I'm going to run this. Um, it's running again, and then I'm going to go back in Tableau. I'm just going to reload the extension. And I've got these what they call a rain cloud density plot. So essentially this is like a kind of, I guess a density. Uh, and then it's got this kind of like the, the, the number of items kind of laid underneath. It looks kind of pretty funky, but uh, I, I kind of wanted to show you like, this would probably take hours, days to build in Tableau natively, but literally you can do it in like a couple of lines of code. So uh, within R, so, and it's also filterable as well. So I'm kind of like, oh, I can look at what the house rain cloud density plot is. Um, so look, I know I've kind of just like kind of really rushed through this and it's way more, It's I've probably made it seem a bit more simple than it actually is because I, I had to spend quite a, a bit of time learning about it. Um, but I will be kind of trying to throw together a, um, a, a blog post at some point to kind of explain it to people who are new. I, I did rely on uh, the tutorials released by the, the R Studio guys who built the package for Shiny Tableau. But I just want to kind of give you a, a like a demonstration of how, you know, once you get it going, relatively easy it is. So I am just going to jump back to my set of slides. Uh, oh, I already talked about this. This is my backup just in case. I, I actually, I'll just quickly touch on some of this stuff. So um, essentially what I was showing you is you have to write the code, run the code, import the extension and configure the UE. So the, the, the UE stuff was all set, built within that, the shiny, the, the code itself I was telling uh, uh, how to communicate with Tableau, like where to map the data, setting titles, setting the data source. One key thing is that you, you actually have to make sure that the the um, the data that you wish to plot must exist as a worksheet on your dashboard. I think that's one of the, the key things that you need to have. So I did have that data sitting there in a container, it just has to be somewhere on the dashboard um, to kind of do this. Um, I've kind of gone through this. So I'm gonna quickly touch on the, this is essentially my last slide, but um, the pros and cons of this approach this is pretty new to me. Um, but the pros that I can see is like, literally you can make plots and charts that are very difficult to create in Tableau, like quite easily uh, within R um, and, and deploy to the dashboard. And essentially once you make the extension once, you can just literally use it unlimited times. So it's basically just mapping variables to like a, a blocker code. Um, and yeah, as I said, minimizes that laborious Tableau calcs or, or data densification, uh, which can be used to do some of these complex plots, but there is definitely some cons. So obviously you need to have some baseline skills in R and Shiny and, and also tidyverse packages such as ggplot. Um, that's not something that, oh, you could perhaps learn it overnight or at least kind of get 
get a feel for it. So it does require some technical skill. Um, the formatting does, is, is much more complicated than you know a default formatting Tableau chart. So you have to kind of accept that as a trade-off. Um, filtering does work, but there are some limitations uh, I've noticed in this domain, um, particularly around kind of like filters that might exist in other sheets. I think oh, sometimes it doesn't seem to work. Um, so there is some kind of limitations there. Um, and then deployment, uh, a deployment extension also might be a bit of a pain. So what I've done is, is I've ran that locally, um, but to deploy in an enterprise context, you'll, you'll need to host this shiny app somewhere. So, but our, our studio do, I think, offer free hosting for some shiny apps. So on shinyapps.io. So you could just like deploy the extension there and, and then get Tableau to, it, to connect to it there. Um, and the last point is, uh, from what I read, there could be some security issues and authentication issues that may exist. But since typically you're just using the data aggregated onto a dashboard, maybe that's not such a big a deal unless you're like storing, I guess, secret keys or other kind of like important data there, then um, yeah, that, that might be, it might not be a huge deal. Um, but yeah, there there is kind of, it's still pretty early days for this, for this extension. Um, so uh, yeah, I think it's version 0.1.1 or something like that. I have even, don't even know if they've continued using it, uh, building on it, but um, I just wanted to kind of show that it is possible. So look, this is my last slide. Thanks everyone for the, hopefully I didn't bore everyone to death, but yeah, essentially innovations like shiny Tableau, uh, I think opened the door to a wider possibility within Tableau. So. I'd be interested to hear like where where people think they could use this and also happy to answer any questions. So, but yeah, thanks for sticking around and thanks to Chimney, Prasan and Annabelle for having me. Awesome. Thanks so much, Dara. That was definitely a, you know, a nice introduction to a potentially, you know, something that we can definitely use to, to do those difficult visualizations in a much simpler way. So I personally will be exploring that since I do have some little bit of code. And I think like, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of open source information. So even for those who are not quite familiar, I think you can, you know, like Dara said, you don't need to be an expert, but I feel like a, a introduction and with the kind of documentation that exists, you should be able to pull, start pulling things together. And then gradually as you're building, you start to, you know, develop more understanding on that stuff. So thanks for that, for sure. Uh, let's see if we've got any questions here. Um, Q and A. Okay, so I see one that's in the chat. It says, "So the dot T-Rex file is really just the spec to connect to the shiny server that's running elsewhere." Does that? Uh, make sense? Yeah. So I, I will kind of preface this by saying I'm not a shiny expert and there's documentation out there, but yeah, I think conceptually that's essentially it is what it is. So it's essentially um, providing kind of, I guess, the rules around how to connect to uh, the server. In the case of my demonstration, I was running it like essentially locally. Um, uh, but yeah, so it's kind of like the rules on how to connect. It also provides the rules on how to configure, uh, how to, how data in Tableau gets processed by the by the code, by the Shiny server, I guess. So that's a pretty poor way of answering it by me. But yeah, I think I think you're, uh, whoever asked that question is essentially on the right track, I guess. All right, awesome. Thanks for that. So let's see one more. I guess so to, to Alyssa Zhang, yes, the recording will be available. There's a YouTube channel. So we're going to share that with you. Um, if you're registered to the group, you'll definitely receive that link later with resources, videos, everything to see later. So one more question before we jump over to the next speaker. And then if you don't mind, Dara, as well, you can kind of hop into the, I see some in the chat, so maybe you might have to look there as well. Um, but I see, okay. So what is the best way to build the viz initially? So in terms of like a data source, is there a way to generate the plot in R first before importing to Tableau? And says, I'd expect you want to develop and tweak the viz in R first. And then when you have it dialed down, then you can import that into Tableau. So do you have a recommendation for that? Oh, yeah, 100%. So uh, very good question by who asked that. That's exactly what I did for this process. So I had a, a separate R script, like where I tested out how, I, like I imported the, the source data that I use in the, in the, in 
the Tableau dashboard and just kind of experimented in ggplot, just running the code till I got the plots looking like how I wanted them. And then essentially I adapted that for the Tableau scenario. So that's exactly what I did. So um, hopefully that answers the questions, but yes, build them in uh, first if you want. Uh, rather than just roll the dice and see how it looks in Tableau, but yeah, I would definitely, I would definitely recommend that approach. Awesome. So, very good question, EJ. So, we're gonna move over to obviously the last but not the least speaker, and I believe this is also someone who is bringing lots of years of experience. So, they've definitely tried and tested a lot of the things we'll be learning from them today. So, uh, let's see here. Uh, for someone you mind presenting the last speaker details i'm trying to uh... okay if it's having issues do you, should i try and see if i i think i might have a window open somewhere yeah it's it's stuck it's saying uh sharing stream but so. okay norris let me let me make an attempt here hopefully this works out All right, so please let me know if you see my screen. Yes. Perfect. Okay. So last but not least, we have Joshua Milligan, who has been at Resultant since 2004, and he is a principal consultant with expertise in software development, visual analytics, and data storytelling. He's experienced in BI development, covering data modeling, ETL, deployment, visualization, dashboard design, and of course, working across different industries like finance, energy, healthcare, and government. So Joshua is a Tableau visionary, right? He's been one since 2014, and we're in 2023 right now. So of course, he is a Hall of Famer, which you can imagine the level of contribution that he's done to the community. So we're really, really lucky to have him here to share some of that with us today, you know? He excels in Tableau obviously and he's committed to teaching and helping people he's an influential mentor in the community and he frequently speaks at conferences and tech events so if you've ever heard of the book learning tableau this is the author right with us here today and so um he's on the 2022 version and basically he's kind of been releasing these like for you know different editions and you get to kind of see you know the best ways to utilize tableau for what it needs to be utilized for and um, I recommend you to check that out. Definitely a lot of a lot of value in that resource there. Um, he lives in Tulsa with his wife and his four children. And today he's going to be presenting about telling data stories that matter, essentially showing us the place of purposeful empathy in visual analytics. So I, I think this is definitely going to be a good um, eye opener and you know discussion starter. So I'm going to pass it over to Joshua. To, to take us home for today. All right, thank you, I appreciate that. Yeah, well, I am incredibly excited to be here with you all and to share about empathy. So we're gonna talk about telling data stories that matter because we like to tell data stories, uh, but but sometimes, sometimes we wonder, does it really matter? Uh, what's my, well, you just had an introduction, so I'll just blow through this, but I am Joshua Milligan and I, I have been at Re for almost 20 years now. Uh, it's, it's been incredible. And I'll pause there just to mention that uh, result in one of the core values at Resultant is purposeful empathy. And it's one that really resonates with me. And I'll tell a story around that here in just a little bit. The Tableau Visionary Hall of Fame, you heard that. Uh, I, I was an IronViz finalist, uh, not a winner, uh, but I had a great time there. There I am on the stage at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas. Uh, it's just a little bit intimidating to be there, but, uh, but it was a lot of fun as well. And uh, yeah, I am the author of Learning Tableau, currently uh, 2022, although there are rumors circulating about a, another edition possibly in the future, so we'll see what happens there. But uh, I, I have enjoyed writing those books and, uh, and 
and have learned more probably in doing that than almost anything else uh, in my career. Uh, because when you go to write about something, you you realize what you don't actually know or understand, and you just kind of were muddling through. Uh, but then you have to put it down on paper and. Uh, and you have to be clear on it. Uh, I'll also mention I, uh, I do like Star Trek, Star Wars, Stargate, Battlestar Galactica. I, I realized the pattern there is anything that has the word star in it. Uh, then someone showed me Dancing with the Stars, and I wasn't quite so sure about that one. But, uh, but some people have another word uh, for that as well. So... Uh, to take that as it will. Uh, in the introduction, uh, my family was mentioned, uh, and uh, I, uh, I love my family. Uh, they're a little bit crazy at times, uh, but we have we have a great time. Not pictured are two large dogs and a bunny rabbit as well. So, uh, so we we have we have a lot of fun. Early in my career with uh, with Tableau, uh, I was working on a dashboard. And this is similar to that dashboard. Uh, and up until that point, I had been doing some things with uh, with uh, credit unions and then the financial sector. And then I, then I moved on to healthcare. And up until that point, I viewed everything as just working with data. Uh, everything was data. It was just in a database. And I was visualizing it and helping people see it and understand it with Tableau. And I loved it. Uh, but as I built out this dashboard, uh, I found myself growing really prideful about uh, about the accomplishment of this dashboard because it, at that point, was one of the most complex, uh, technically complex things that I had ever done. And I was working with a team that was building out a data warehouse, and we were doing all sorts of incredible things. And I, I created this analytical tool that uh, that the team at the hospital could use, and they could switch back and forth and uh, and see you know maybe maybe looking at people with uh, with pneumonia and uh, and then they could see you know every every row here is a is a patient and every every mark on this gantt chart is a time that the patient spent in the hospital and then we were looking for uh, uh, for visits that had certain diagnoses and then a window of time after that and then were they readmitted and there were all kinds of technical challenges to overcome. And I was working on this dashboard. And then one day, as I was working on it, I realized this mark here represents a real person who was really in the hospital. And they had a real serious condition. And, uh, it, and, and it just hit me that I'm not working only with data. The data that I'm working with impacts real people and real situations and real lives. And, and hopefully it can make a real positive difference for people. And, uh, and as, I, as I started to understand that perspective, uh, it, it opened up a whole new world for me that, uh, that I understood that my job wasn't just to help people understand data. It was to help people make key decisions that would impact people's lives and hopefully for the better. And so that's uh, that's what I started to understand. And, and as I explored that, uh, I began to realize that empathy has a place as we think about visual analytics, and it has a place for telling data stories that really, truly matter. And that was kind of the beginning of that journey for me. Because all data relates to real people. And so I'm going to, uh, uh, I'm going to talk about that today. The fact that everything that we do has has a real purpose behind it. If you think about this this Gantt chart and you think about what uh, what people are impacted, uh, there there's actually quite a few different uh, groups of people who are impacted by this data or represented by the data. You know, you might think of the doctors and the nurses. Uh, they might actually be using this dashboard or some version of it to make decisions and to to look at the patients and the readmissions of patients and to understand what can they do that will make a difference for their patients. Uh, what sorts of procedures, what sorts of medications, what sorts of treatment plans can they put in place that will reduce uh, the number of times that patients come back into the hospital? You think of the hospital administrators. I mean, they're impacted by this. Uh, they, they, you know, 
sometimes you think, well, they're just they just care about the bottom line. Well, they care about the patients too, uh, but they they have other concerns as well. They they want to uh, they want to meet regulations and uh, and and things that that govern hospitals and patient care, and they want to uh, they want to understand how can they help their physicians and nurses uh, do the best possible job and create an environment where they can do the best possible job. And of course, it it impacts the patients as well uh, uh, because it, it it's going to help uh, their their standard of care and hopefully improve it. And then and then there are people that uh, that aren't even pictured here. Uh, there are the other the other employees of the hospital, uh, the families of the patients, the families of the doctors, uh, all kinds of people that ultimately, uh, maybe directly, maybe indirectly we are uh, impacting with the data and showing the data and uh, and representing these people with the data. And this is the exercise that, that I have tried to implement every time I go to build a dashboard or a data visualization or to tell a data story. And that is to put myself in the place of every person or every group of people that are either represented by the data or or possibly in some way impacted by the data. So for example, let's take this data story. These are, uh, these are a distribution of test scores uh, for a thousand, around a thousand students. And you can see uh, going uh, vertically indicates the, the number of students, uh, horizontally indicates the test scores to the right, but the, is the better scores. And, uh, and then you have, you have some that were failing and some that were passing. And so the data story here, uh, just based on the label, over 75% of students passed. Now, I don't know, maybe this is an individual test, maybe this is a class, uh, it's not, not entirely clear. Uh, the context obviously matters. But what I'm going to do is, is I want this to be a little bit interactive. So I'm gonna watch in the chat and I, I want you guys to just type in there, who is represented or affected by this data? What, what groups or individuals? All right, some answers are coming through. Everyone who is failing, the students, teachers, failing individuals and how they deal with it, the administration, teachers, students and teachers, administrators, parents. Yeah, I love it, I love it. Um, yeah, you guys are thinking of some great things. So yeah, the students, the teachers, the administrators, uh, the parents and family members of, of the students and teachers and administrators, the, the broader community. Uh, and, and you could probably think of many, many more uh, people who are impacted or represented by the data here. And, uh, and so the way that we tell the story is going to make an impact, right? And notice this story, uh, just even in the way that it's phrased, is a positive story, or at least it's phrased as a positive story. Over 75% of students passed. Uh, that's that's presented as as a good thing here. The uh, even even the colors kind of indicate that uh, that that's considered a good thing. And so empathy makes me think. You know, what if I'm a student? How does this impact me? What if I'm a teacher? How does this impact me? And it also causes me to to wonder what happens if we change the story even so slightly. Now we didn't change the data. We didn't change the uh, analysis. We didn't even change the presentation. All we did was change a title or a subtitle, and we've changed the story. Nearly 25% of students failed. Now we've changed the whole uh, dynamic here. We've uh, we've we've changed the focus of the story, and in in just in just a slight subtle change. And so empathy requires that that I need to think through what. What does that do? Well, it, for, from a student perspective, it shifts the focus to the students who are failing. Uh, from a teacher perspective, it may raise questions about, about are the teachers doing their jobs correctly? Are they, are they teaching adequately? Uh, are the administrators doing their jobs uh, correctly? Uh, what about the parents and family? What role do they play uh, in, in this failure? And, uh, and how does that impact the community? And so on both sides, whether I'm gonna present a positive story or a negative story, I need to think through all of the implications of that. And that becomes especially important when the data may point to other things going on. So take, take this story that, uh, that alters it slightly. 
What if you saw this distribution of scores? And I'll watch the chat to see if anyone has any ideas about how you might interpret this. More students are passing than failing, so that's true. The third third blue bar was kind of a fluke, maybe. So in the in the original, we had this really nice normal distribution kind of curve, and it it looked natural. It kind of looked the way that you would expect it. Here, what uh, what what it looks like maybe happening is that as you move up the curve, you had some students who maybe maybe were failing and then uh, somehow got bumped up to just barely passing. Maybe that's grade manipulation going on. Maybe uh, maybe there's something a little bit odd or strange going on. At least it raises the question, right? But empathy requires that we need to ask, what's the impact of sharing a negative story like this? And And we'd go through the same exercise for the students, for the teachers, for the administrators. I mean, if, they're, they're, if there's grade manipulation going on, uh, that impacts the students greatly. Uh, it calls into question, did these students really pass fairly? Did they, what about the ones that are failing? Were they, you know, it, it throws it all into question. What about the teachers? Are they the ones doing the manipulation? Maybe it's the administration. Maybe it's uh, maybe the family and parents, you know, and it, we, so we go through this list and we start to think about what are the implications. But even beyond that, uh, empathy requires that we that we don't just present the story and the data and draw a conclusion. It requires that we think that through. And it even requires that we ask, what if we're wrong? Because maybe it's not grade manipulation. Maybe that's jumping to a conclusion. Maybe there's something else going on. Maybe the data itself is wrong. Maybe our interpretation is wrong. Maybe our analysis is wrong. Maybe our, maybe our presentation itself is wrong. Or maybe our assumption is wrong. It could be that we assumed that this was a, an objective test, you know, multiple choice, and you're either right or wrong. And, and uh, so something strange going on in the data means that that someone blatantly cheated on the on the uh, on the test or blatantly manipulated the grades, but maybe it was subjective. Maybe maybe the teacher was looking at an essay and thought, yeah, this isn't really. It's it's just on the borderline, but but they took pity. They had empathy for the student, and they they uh, they gave them a slightly better score because the student tried. Um, so maybe maybe we need to question our assumptions even, and we need to really think through: Are we presenting the correct story? What about this? Take a look at this chart here. When uh, this data story has a call to action, East Region Management should be fired. Look at the profit of West versus East. West um, is uh, is is uh, incredibly higher than East, right? Yeah, I see in the chat. Some of you have already seen it. The axis isn't set at zero. Uh, maybe East Region Management shouldn't be fired. Maybe the analyst should be fired or the data storyteller, because uh, just the way that we present a story uh, can either be misleading or or wrong. And empathy requires that that not only do we question our assumptions and our interpretations, but it, it requires that we think through the fact that if we if we manipulate the results or we manipulate the way that we present the results to emphasize or tell tell a certain part of the story, we're going to have an impact on people. I mean, think about all the people that are impacted if we say East Region Management should be fired. I mean, obviously, the managers themselves uh, <laughs> that we're we're telling we're telling people they should be fired. Uh, that's that's a very negative impact. Uh, the employees that those managers uh, are, are over that that impacts them greatly. Um, the analysts themselves, the data storyteller. Uh, you know, sometimes we think that we uh, stand apart from the story, but 
But the truth is, is that we don't. We're part of the story in even just telling it. Uh, and and if if we misrepresent something or or we're not careful in the way that we treat the data, uh, that raises a lot of questions about our integrity. So so it impacts us. The decision makers, you know, if I'm taking this to the board and showing them something, whether it's true or not, uh, the decisions that they make are going to reflect on them. Uh, the customers of, of the East region are going to be affected with the decisions that are made. And the families of all of these people, then the communities of all of these people are going to be impacted uh, by the decisions that we make based on the data and, and how we've presented it. The stronger our call to action, so here East region management should be fired, but but sometimes sometimes it's not that strong sometimes we just raise a question or sometimes we just uh we just show sales are declining what should we do um but the stronger our call to action the more we need to test our assumptions and make sure we've got the data right and make sure our analysis is right and the more we need to have empathy for the people that that we're representing or impacting with the data stories that we're telling Empathy also calls us to understand what people truly need. I, I had a boss uh, early on in my career who would always who would always challenge us as we as we worked with different clients. He would say, "Don't just uh, hear their questions. Find out what the question is behind the question, because uh, because you'll have people say, "Well, I need a dashboard that shows me such and such." Well, why? Why do they need that? What is it that they really want to know? If they say they want to know about sales, what sorts of questions are they uh, are they asking about sales? What sorts of decisions are they making? And find out what's really driving those decisions. So, for example, uh, a manager says, "I need a dashboard uh, that shows widget production for my team," and uh, and so we might uh, we might start to build that out. We might start to analyze the data. Uh, I'll I'll watch the uh, the chat and you guys can sort of guide me. I've got a simple data set here with uh, with a manager, uh, the name of individuals, um, some dates. Uh, I'll uh, I'll watch there briefly uh, and also watching time to think through what sorts of things might we think about if if manager Mary says I need a dashboard to show widget production for my team. Compare prior year or budget. Yeah, I see some things. So I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna pull out. Let's let's look at manager first. So there's Mary. Um, we've got we've got uh, Mary there. Let's uh, make this the entire view, and uh, or at least the, the width. And then maybe uh, maybe I'll bring out the individual people on the team. So this is interesting. I've got uh, I've got individual people on the team. I've got uh, I've got the number of widgets that they're making. Uh, I might say, well, Mary's the one asking for this, so let's look at her team. Let's uh, let's take a look at that. Let's look at um, let's let's order that. Uh, yeah, I see some other some other thoughts there. Questions about are we comparing team to team? That that could be a point too. Uh, some questions about goal. So maybe I bring in the goal and we take a look at that. And so I might start to build out something that uh, that allows me to look at the goal. And uh, let's get rid of some of the uh, some of that there and switch the reference line fields. So now I've got uh, I've got the idea of number of widgets to a goal. I haven't brought in any of the time. I saw some of that in the in the chat. Uh, some of the dates and time elements, um, but this maybe is is the start of something. I could say, have individuals on Mary's team met the goal or not, and uh, and maybe I want to emphasize those who have not met their goal. All kinds of questions. You know, why why are some people's goals so much higher than other people's? Uh, maybe they've been there longer. All kinds of things that we might we might think about asking. So. So I, I take that to Mary, and I say, "Here's a, here's what I've created for you. I've created something that that uh, that shows you your entire team. It shows you who's met the goals, who have not met the goals, and it shows you the order. And uh, 
who does this data represent or affect? I'm going to go through that same sort of uh, same sort of thought process. We didn't even do that. We just jumped right into building the dashboard. And I need to ask, well, what if I'm wrong? And what's the impact of this data story? Who or what does it emphasize? So I'm emphasizing when I do this, I'm emphasizing individuals on a team. I'm emphasizing how much they've produced and their goal. And I've rank ordered it. So I am I am implicitly saying there is some sort of a, a rank or some sort of an order that that is associated with the number of widgets that are, that are produced. I've also shown the goal. I've shown and emphasized who has not met that goal. And so I, I, I feel pretty good that maybe that's the emphasis that I need. Um, what does it leave out? Well, some of you mentioned in the chat, it leaves out a comparison to other teams. It leaves out a, an understanding of the time frame. Maybe some of these individuals uh, have been uh, part of the, the company for the entire year. Maybe some of them just came on board and that's why their production is smaller. Um, so all kinds of things that it might actually leave out. And what's the outcome of this? Well, I probably should have asked Mary, what what was your uh, what decisions are you going to make based on this? Does it meet her needs and requirements? And uh, and she comes back and says, no, that's not what I needed at all. Um, I don't really care so much about individual performance. It's it's not a competition. Uh, it's based on the team. I want to know how the team is performing and maybe how it's performing compared to other teams. Uh, but I really care about our performance over time because time uh, is something that can impact impact things. Uh, the goal is an annual goal, and uh, and so I need to think about that in terms of how is the team performing, and how is it doing over time. And so as the team looks over time, and uh, and charts their progress towards the goal, uh, I can see that there are times when they're above the line. I can see that there are a few times maybe where they're below the line. Uh, and and the point here is, is they're working together as a team. And that's what Mary cares about. She wants to know, is my team performing? There's some time maybe in the summer where people go on vacation and, and aren't producing as much. Some time towards the end of the year, uh, perhaps coming up as well. Uh, and so so as we, as we think about this, we think about uh, what's the impact of this story? This story is much more team emphasis. This, this story is much more over time. And there are times that you're ahead. There's times that you're behind. But we're all working towards a common goal. And it's all, it's all based on year over year. Uh, what does this leave out? Well, you know, I might, I might go to Mary and say, you know, there is actually some benefit of looking at your individual uh, team members. So maybe we bring both of those together in a dashboard. And uh, and so maybe we collaborate on on different things that uh, that I had an idea about and that she she wanted, uh, and there can be some some good outcomes based on that. Does this meet her needs and requirements? Well, yeah. Now that now that I've uh, figured out what she really wanted, empathy means that we care enough for the audience of our story that we ask them to care too. You know, sometimes we build a dashboard, we throw it out there and uh, and we wonder, does anybody ever use it? Does anybody ever care? Well, sometimes, sometimes they do care, but sometimes they don't sense that we cared. And because of that, uh, it doesn't meet the mark. So for example, the, the, what we just went through, uh, the initial thing that I created, Mary's not going to care very much about that. And if I left it at that, what I'm communicating is, is I don't care either. But the fact that I can work through and collaborate with her, uh, it means that I do care. It, it means that I'm listening. It means that uh, it means that I'm adjusting and I'm iterating through. I'm validating my results uh, and I'm telling the story in a way that is meaningful to to the audience. And it also means that I'm willing to admit when I'm wrong. Uh, if I miss the mark the first time, I'm willing to adjust. And uh, and when I show that I care, then I'm helping them to care as well. Part of helping our audience care is helping them have that same realization that I had, that this isn't just data. This is uh, This is real people. And this is real lives and, and the decisions that we make matter. And so take, for example, 
something that you might have on a dashboard. Maybe it's a KPI or it's, it's just a number, 22%. And I've put of children. Uh, I don't have any other context here for you. Maybe it's 22% of children are vaccinated for some disease or maybe 22% of children aren't uh, getting the nutrition that they need, or, or who knows what it is. Uh, but if I just put it out there as 22% uh, of children, that has one level of impact. But consider how other ways of presenting that same information might hit you at different levels. What if I show it like this, as a stacked bar? Or even as a even as a pie chart, maybe, but but especially a stacked bar because because here I'm I'm communicating there are individual children involved. It's not just some percentage. Uh, there are individuals uh, who are impacted. 225 children. It brings it it brings it down to a more human level. Just just in presenting it as as a bar chart. But maybe maybe that even isn't uh, isn't as good as it could be, right? What if I did this? What if I said 22% of children in Florida, and in addition to the pie chart, I've put a, an outline of the state of Florida. Now, if, if you're in the United States, uh, usually uh, you're going to recognize immediately the outline of your state. Uh, and, and if I presented this to an audience in Florida, uh, they're going to see this and they're going to uh, immediately have a connection to that. They're going to say, that's home. Uh, that's that's where I live. And so it, it makes that connection of place. Uh, if you're outside the United States, then then that may not be quite as meaningful. So knowing your audience, uh, there, I know there are a couple of you in the audience who might uh, appreciate Australia, right? 22% of children in Australia where you live, that's home for you, right? So, so just making a connection. It used to be uh, data visualization purists would call that sort of thing chart junk, you know, uh, putting, putting a flag there or putting, putting a, an icon of a child or something. Uh, but that actually is something that can connect with the audience at a human level uh, and, and helps them see that what we're talking about is real life. What about something like this? Uh, having having an image that is actually a child uh, or, or even just a representation of a child. And so now we're not talking 22% of children. We're not talking 225 children. We're actually showing you that's two out of every 10 uh, children. And, uh, you know, and you look at that and you think, ah, oh, I've got children. Um, and uh, and they, they do funny things like that. So it, it just connects that data with you at a human level. Let's take, for example, our, uh, our, our chart that we made for, uh, for Mary initially, and she said she didn't like it. But, uh, but, but one thing that we could do with something like this is to make this more, more human relatable, right? Tableau has a really cool option uh, now. If, you're, if your data has, has a URL in it, you can actually show an image, right? And so we might even come back to, uh, to ours. And we've got uh, we've got these individuals. And if I bring in if I bring in a URL, I've got a headshot URL, and I bring it in on rows, it just shows up as a URL, unless I tell Tableau that this is actually a URL that points to an image. So I'll just use the drop down and say the image role is URL, and now. Tableau will show me an image. So this is one way that you know you could show products, you could show you could show uh, uh, buildings, you could show whatever. But but when you show people and you say these are actual people, and Mary's going to recognize them, and it just brings it home. It it makes it it makes it something where she says, "Oh, I know Raymond. Yeah, he's uh, he's he's not." Uh, he's, he's meeting his goal. And I know Annie and she's not meeting her goal, but I know why she's not meeting her goal. And it, it just brings it home. Now, this isn't always appropriate. And there are times when it, when it actually may be totally inappropriate to show a person's image. So I'm not saying that this is what you should always do. But there are cases where this may actually really help someone make a connection between the data and the, the real life person behind it. Finally, empathy means that we give everyone a voice. And, uh, and, and so we talked about the fact that we need to listen to the people who are going to be uh, members of our audience. But we also need to think about the fact that people in our, uh, in, in our data need to have a voice.
And so take, for example, a, a data story like this. We have two topics of concern, topic A and topic B. And then we've polled a group of people and, uh, and then we've, sh we've shown what the different levels of concern are for different groups within that, uh, within that topic. And so I can see, you know, I've got, I've got Hispanic uh, female and male and Asian females. And, and I'm seeing, you know, as a whole, what does that group uh, think about topic A or topic B? How much concern do they have for it? But then, as I, as I look at this from a data perspective and from a statistical perspective, I start to realize some of these groups are not uh, statistically significant. Um, here, I've only got three, three individuals that make up this group. So the problem with that is, is that I could be, I could be totally misstating uh, the data. That, that doesn't really mean that all Asian females feel that way. Um, now, truthfully, none of these marks mean that that group feels that way completely. But I may be, I may be totally misrepresenting the aggregation of that group. So statistically insignificant, but absolutely not humanly insignificant. How do I give everyone a voice? What can I do uh, to potentially show this? You know, from a statistical perspective, I should probably take that. Uh, that circle out of the uh, out of the scatter plot. But if I do that, then I'm not fairly representing all the different groups that I have in my data. So how do we tell this story well? Um, you know, you might think of different ways to do that. You might think, well, let's let's keep it there, but let's uh, let's use size maybe to uh, to indicate uh, the different groups. And so. Asian females are still represented, but but we're showing that that statistically there's not as many in that group, and that might that might be a good way of doing it. But there are some there are some problems there as well because that tends to diminish or say that group is not as important, and we don't we don't want to communicate that. That's not our goal. So that may not be the best way. Uh, we might think of other possibilities. We might uh, we might change the mark type. Uh, just to say, here's here's a representative representation of the group, but it's not statistically valid uh, or st or significant. Um, but we don't want to we don't want to lose that it's there. Uh, one thing that that this might point out is it might point out that uh, that the way that we collected the data was wrong. Maybe we didn't interview enough people or enough minority groups to get the data that we really need. Uh, that may be that may be true, uh, although there is a sense in which at some point we're going to slice the data down to a point where there are going to be groups that we just don't have enough data to represent. So empathy is going to mean we're going to have humility and we're going to say sometimes there aren't perfect answers for how we tell a story. Uh, but what we don't want to do is we don't want to lose the fact that that we've got real people in here. So part of the story might be. That, uh, that we recognize that it's told at an individual level. So we may show the aggregation, but we may also show the distribution of individuals. And so here are the marks that represent the individuals that weren't statistically significant, but they are individual people. So part of it is, is that we may tell a story that, that goes down to that individual level. But part of it is, is we also need to realize that the people are not defined by the data. So the, the data itself tells us something about the person, but it doesn't tell us everything about the person. It doesn't tell us everything about the group. And, and so part of, part of empathy is understanding we can only tell as much of the story as what we have. And we need to be careful in how we tell the story so that we don't imply that the data is telling the whole story. Empathy helps us remember that all data relates to real people. And I appreciate being here very much. I'm not sure how much time we have, but if there are any questions, we'll try to, uh, we'll try to get to those. Awesome. That was that was definitely a good a good one there. Lots to think about in terms of, you know, 
the fact is we are, we're creating data products, we're utilizing data, but ultimately there are people who are, you know, beneath this information. So I think it's always important to be thoughtful around, you know, how we're presenting things, what kind of stories we're telling, and of course that impact. So thanks for that, Josh. Uh, we're a bit tight on time, but let me just see if we can catch a few questions. And then if needed, you know, please reach out to Josh individually to kind of have, and I think this is a really valuable discussion to have around data bits and, you know, analytics. So, okay. I don't see. Okay. I think, I think we're good on the questions. Let me just look through to the chat in case there are any there. Okay. So I think we're good. And so Frank, to answer your question, the recording is going to be sent out after. So you can look out for a follow-up email probably over the next few days, maybe next week. But we will have this sent out so you can rewatch this at any points in time. And so I'm going to uh, pass it over back to Prasant to take us home today. And um, thanks again to all our speakers for giving us some great content today. Oh, Jim, do you going to share your screen for me, please? Okay, so um, I think we are at the end and uh, it was a great session with lots of learnings, lots of knowledge, and it was great to see everyone having that interaction, having all the questions put up, I think it was great to have you all here and happy holidays and see you next year. If you haven't registered to our channel, please do, please scan this QR code and register there so that you should be able to know what are the events that are coming up. We, we, have, we are already planning 2024 and we are really, really excited to bring lots of amazing content to you. And uh, thank you so much again for being here, for building up that enthusiasm in the chat box itself. And yes, let's celebrate the power of visual analytics and apply to present. Have a great day. Good night, everyone. Take care and a very happy new year and Christmas as well to all of you. And see you in next year. And let us know if you have any questions. You can always ping us on LinkedIn. And yeah, that's it. Take care.